Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's Steve here again from the Steve and Sully study. I've decided to, um, to do a podcast today based upon uh, uh, a company that uh, I, I work at or work alongside every single day, Woodbury House, and also one of the main artists that we represent and I wanted to give a bit of a, um, a back story to how we started working with this particular artist and more importantly, some of the frequently asked questions from collectors, art lovers, art investors, and people just getting into art for the first time, why they would end up buying or collecting a Richard Hamilton artwork. Uh, just before I go through these questions, um, us at Woodbury House, we've, uh, we've done many different shows, different bit of content, um, cool ideas or cool collaborations surrounding the artist over the last five to six years. We've done a show um, back in 2015 with a big restaurant called La Catina de Foie Bois uh, over in Dubai in the UAE, uh, which was very, very successful. Roughly about a year later, we've done a show with many different street, street artists and contemporary artists, but also featuring Richard Hamilton in that in um, Mexico City with a big um, gallery called L L LS Galleria. And then after that, we've done a collaboration with a clothing company called Dark Circle Clothing, which we've done a show here at Woodbury House's studio in the heart of Soho. Um, so over the years, we've developed as a company, and as we've developed, so it has its market. So I wanted to share some of our experiences, and more importantly, our answer some of the questions that some of our collectors or investors have asked us over the years, and I just felt it made sense to do not only a podcast, around the Richard Hamilton movement, but more importantly, do some co content for uh, Woodbury House. So on our YouTube channel, on our Instagram, Facebook, on our social media channels, we're gonna release some snippets and some answers to some of these questions. I'm currently sat at the Woodbury House studio um, in Archer Street, Soho. So if, if you haven't um, had a chance to come down and see some of the art down here, um, I suggest you make a, a booking with the team or myself. Um, we represent a few different artists, uh, namely uh, we have Days, who's been affiliated to Richard Hamilton, Futura, Retina, um, some other uh, British artists as well, but I would say mostly 80, 85% of our focus has been on Richard Hamilton just because the market's been so exciting. Uh, it's been booming in the last few months with different auctions and things and different shows by different galleries as well, which shows the credibility and the uh, validation that Richard Hamilton has in the art market. And there's been many different references by different um, uh, street artists who've, uh, who've drawn a lot of um, inspiration and excitement from his work. So I just I felt it just was right just to go through uh, some, some of the stuff that we've learned over the last few years and, and, and share uh, some of our knowledge. So start with the top one. Um, where did his market start from? To answer that, I'm going to give you uh, an answer that uh, I had a mentor when I first got, got into art about five, six years ago, and this is the answer he gave me. Um, the market that has been booming for the last two, three, four, five years, or maybe even longer, is probably the most exciting market that is still thriving today, which is the street art movement. Some people call it urban art, some people call it contemporary street art, some people call it graffiti, some people call it public art. No matter what you call it, um, it's a market that is still uh, very much alive, and many of the big auction houses are uh, doing many different auctions every quarter surrounding this movement. One of the household names that people re reference a lot of the time is a, a, a guy and, a, a, and an artist who's quite elusive, a guy called Banksy. Now many art critics and art lovers and investors who collect Banksy, they all say, or a lot of them have said, uh, that Banksy owes some kind of um, small royalty uh, to people like Richard Hamilton because of all the influence that he gave Banksy and his work. Um, now, the street art movement is derived from pop art. The main person that started pop art, there was a few different artists, but one of them who was renowned for pop art was um, Andy Warhol. That had a, he had a very, very uh, close relationship at the back, of his, back end of his career with an artist called Jean-Michel Basquiat, which I'll get, get into in a moment. 
and pop art has evolved from a scene or a genre genre that Picasso uh, started, which was um, modern art. Now it's um, it, it's very known that if everyone had the the power to turn back the hands of time and collect Picasso's before um, the modern art era took off, everyone would be in a much better financial position than they are today. And the same thing happened with pop art. If everyone saw the big wave of pop art and all the big collectors, museums, galleries, um, art dealers jumping on the movement of pop art and buying uh, people like Roy Lichtenstein and people like Andy Warhol, again, their portfolios will be thriving and they will be compounding and they would definitely be holding some of the most desirable um, collections of pop art today. And ever since that movement, we've now got today's current movement, which is the street art movement. So Richard Hamilton, along with Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring, started and pioneered the street art movement. And one of the reasons why is because they wanted to tell the story of what was happening back in New York. There was a lot of crime, there was a lot of drugs, there was prostitution, there was gangs, there was violence. And a lot of these artists wanted to express their um, uh, stories and their life and express what was happening back then by painting the streets of New York. Second question we get asked quite a lot is, where is Richard Hamilton from? Where was, he, where was he born? Most people believe or mistake sometimes that he was from New York because he made his name now. In actual fact, he was um, a Canadian born uh, individual from Vancouver, but he did make his name from, from predominantly from New York City. Going on to the third question, where did he make his name? Now he painted all around the world. You could find some of his works in Paris, London, uh, Rome, and um, many other parts around the world. He, he made um, some movements over in, in Asia, um, but he was definitely known and um, pioneered most of his work in New York City in America. Number five, who did he work alongside? Now, a lot of artists, including Ramosi, uh, Futura, uh, Crash, Days. Uh, Days is a guy that we actually um, done a show with, uh, Woodbury House done a show with uh, this year in 2019, I think back in uh, roughly about April, May sort of time um, in, in Soho, <coughs> which was a very, very su successful event. Um, Days actually, funny enough, I'd done a podcast with Days and he revealed on that podcast that he was a uh, tenant for Richard Hamilton. Richard Hamilton, believe it or not, when he was a bit more coherent, he was a landlord and his tenant was some of the street artists that have made their, their names off the back end of it. Um, and one of them namely being Days. Uh, but the two main guys that he aligned himself with were, were um, Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. They used to paint the streets of New York and they used to uh, call um, their work, not necessarily graffiti or street art, but it was known as public art. He used to say that this work was for the public. So he used to align himself with Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring. And there was a very interesting story that um, Jean-Michel Basquiat um, uh, spoke about. There was an, um, a photog photographer, a guy called, um, who was still living today, a guy called Hank O'Neill, and he used to go around the, the streets of New York to document the works of many different artists, but predominantly Richard Hamilton, Keith Haring, and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And there was a skull, um, Jean-Michel Basquiat used to be, uh, used to dub Samo, uh, he used to be known for that, um, and he made a skull over the top of a Richard Hamilton uh, shadow man, which Hank O'Neill took a photo of. And when he was questioned and when he was challenged on the fact that, uh, why did he go over the work of Richard Hamilton? He said that he felt he wasn't recognized as, uh, as much as uh, Keith Faring or as much as Richard Hamilton. So to get a bit more recognition, he used to go over the works of other artists, including Richard Hamilton, to get that recognition and, and also to get uh, spotted by um, maybe different publications or different people looking at the, 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 the street art. The funny thing um, 
the funny thing is that Jean-Michel Basquiat's market over the last few years certainly has compounded and got into some of the most strongest collectors portfolios and he's been known as um, a legend in the street art movement. Number six, are there any case studies of his affiliates and where has their markets gone? In 1983 there was a article published by the International Herald Trib Tribune. You can find this in the Richard Hamilton official brochure or if you go online and look at the Wikipedia page you will find it and this is a bit of a case study. It basically said Back in 1983, there was a big surge and a big wave of collectors, art lovers, and investors buying into street art. And if you were to buy a Jean-Michel Basquiat back then, in 1983, you would be paying roughly $10,000 for one of his artworks. <clears throat> in, in the same year, or the same kind of era, if you were to buy a Richard Hamilton or a Keith Haring, you would be looking to invest roughly about $15,000, which is a huge amount of money back then. Today, Richard Hamilton's market has definitely compounded and amplified, but I think more so um, Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat's market have, have moved mount mountains. Um, Keith Haring's auctions have gone tens of thousands, of, sorry, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars and into the millions. But Jean-Michel Basquiat has broken so many uh, staggering records. One of his works in 2017, which I believe was in the Christie's auction, went for $110.5 million, which was bought by a billionaire. The same billionaire has bought a few works of uh, the great artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. But that same piece that was bought for $110.5 million back in 1984, was purchased for $19,000. So the case study from inter the International Herald Tribune, which was saying that as Jean-Michel Basquiat was going for roughly about $10,000, back in 1984, a year after, I went for $19,000. But if you're looking at 2017, one of his works went for $110.5 million that went to a billionaire. So you can see the incremental steps where his market has gone. And what that certainly means for Richard Hamilton, even though there's no guarantees, there's lots of um, suggestions and hallmarks to say that he's gonna be following the same sort of footsteps. And we're already seeing it today. The next one, <clears throat> number seven. Throat is a bit croaky today. Number seven, documentaries or films. Jean-Michel Basquiat has a uh, documentary which I believe is called The Radiant Child. Um, very, very good documentary which features Andy Warhol. It's a very, very um, enlightening, exciting documentary, but more importantly, educational. Banksy has got one, which I suggest you watch because if you want to know about, uh, predict, if you want to predict the future for their market, I believe you need to know the history. And the way you know the history is by reading by going to art museums, by going to galleries, by going to art lovers, investors, but more importantly, watching their documentaries. And Richard Hamilton has a very, very good uh, documentary film that we have played in private many times and also at the Curtain Hotel over the last few years in, uh, for our, our collectors and people that wanted to know a bit more about his work. And they wanted to learn a bit more because the more you learn, the more that you're gonna love um, his artwork and appreciate why he done certain things. Um, his film is called The Shadow Man and it was first premiered in uh, uh, the Tribeca Film Festival and it was put together by uh, a director called Orion Jacobi. It won an award and ever since then um, many people watched his uh, documentary. I think it was featured on Amazon or featured on one of the major uh, platforms, I think on Apple as well. We've had a lot of um, clients approach us at Woodbury House simply because they've watched the documentary, they've loved his work, they've loved the documentary itself, they've grown to understand his market and they feel it's a good place to put their money. No matter whether they're investing, collecting or just want to decorate their, their home or office. When did he pass away? Um, he sadly passed away in October um, 2017. Um, 
He unfortunately uh, had a life of abuse through substances and um, he deteriorated over time and he, he contracted a few diseases and I felt this led to his death. Uh, I don't actually have the exact reason why he died, but sadly he died in, uh, in 2017. Another question asked to us, is his work featured in any museums? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the irony, just before he died in 2017, his work got admitted to the permanent collection of the MoMA. The MoMA stands for the Museum, Museum of Modern Art. So if you're ever in New York and you're into art and you want to learn more about street art and more importantly the Richard Hamilton market, I suggest you go to the moment and see one of his particular pieces which is unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> the MoMA has been known for um, almost um, reflecting their opinion about a particular artist or particular genre. So basically if the MoMA accept one of the artists as, uh, as part of the permanent collection. Basically what they're saying to the whole art world is this artist is not just great and it doesn't just look good, but this artist is important to art history. Without this artist, the art market or the genre that they pioneered may not be as stable or, or as strong as it is today. And Richard Hamilton has been known for that. So he's part of the permanent collection of the MoMA, which is a big museum. We stand for the Museum of Modern Art. What is his style and what is he best known for? He has different vari variations of art. There's been the landscapes, which are known as uh, the beautiful paintings. Back in the late 70s, he'd done uh, the mass murder scenes where he used to recreate uh, murders back in New York. But what he's really no known for and the reason why the uh, New York Times dubbed him as the Godfather of street art is because he used to do the Shadow Men series or the Lurking Shadow Men. So you have shadow heads, you have um, standing shadows, you have jumping shadow men. And also the offshoots of them are the Shadow Cats, um, the Love Hearts, and also uh, the Rodeo series, which inspired um, the Marlboro Cigarette Company, which is a multi billion dollar organization uh, founded in, in America. And the last one, what has happened to his market ever since he passed away a few years ago? His market has definitely grown. Um, auction houses such as Sotheby's, Christie's, Phillips have all done auctions for uh, the artist. And most of the auctions have smashed and broken every single estimate. One of the auctions that happened shortly after his passing from Sotheby's had a piece which went in there for uh, a prediction or an estimate between 20 and $30,000 and it ended up going for a 150,000. Um, other auctions have, have taken place and we've seen some of his work go over 200, 250,000 and many believe, who have been part of his market for the last five or 10 years, many believe that his market is only gonna grow stronger and we're gonna see some uh, milestone, <clears throat> record-breaking auctions from, from the artist. Um, we all know that he has done work um, with different galleries um, di and in different parts of the world. He's done different collaborations. And there was also a time when he'd done roughly about five or six shows with the, the great fashion uh, guru, Giorgio Armani, which was absolutely incredible. And the point I'm trying to make is there are going to be many other opportunities, certainly from the archive or from the estate where they can do collaborations and do some licensing uh, deals and we, we feel the market because of that is going to grow and grow and grow and there's going to be many different corporations jumping on uh, the Hamilton movement. Our prediction at Woodbury House is it's, very, very, it's always very, very difficult to know or guarantee where his market's going to, going to go. But unfortunately, sometimes one of the best career moves an artist can make, if you look at history, is when they pass away, the market just goes up. So we feel that um, ever since him uh, departing, um, we feel that he, his market is gonna grow stronger and it's gonna become a lot more lucrative and we feel there's gonna be some exciting projects. I'm sitting next to a 1980s uh, Stanley Shadow Man, which is part of the Nightlife series, which we are gonna be doing some kind of um, show for early part of next year. We're actually looking to um, 
develop this idea further in the next coming days and weeks. And we're going to be announcing some of our exciting projects with the Nightlife series and also with uh, Richard Hamilton again um, and some of his original work and also limited editions um, early part of 2020. So watch this space. Um, I hope that's given some clarity, some uh, understanding about what we do here at Woodbury House and also some of, some of the things that I've been doing uh, over the last five or six years for the Richard Hamilton market. I believe it's a market that is a, a very exciting market. It was a story that wasn't told for many years. Richard Hamilton was a bit of a, an art rebel, <clears throat> didn't really conform to the art market unlike his predecessors Jean-Michel Basquet and Keith Haring. And because of that, I think that's why it's, it's drawn a lot of serious art collectors to his market because he was a true artist artist and um, I think <clears throat> there's some other untold stories such as the Nightlife series that need to be told. So many galleries, many art agencies, many art lovers and serious art dealers, which we are, um, are going to put on shows to really uh, project some some of the stories and some of the things that we've learned over the last five years or so. My name is Stephen Sully, part of the Woodbury House team here. Um, please book in with us, hit us up on social media. Be happy, never content, and I hope you got a lot from this um, from this podcast. Thank you.